please join me in welcoming Dr. Ilke Altentaz. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here. So just a little bit about myself, as uh, was mentioned, I'm at uh, UC San Diego, and my background is in data and computing. I'm a computer science uh, who was trained in data and computing. But for me, the biggest part of my job is the applications of them, both data science and computational science, together with uh, computing and data infrastructure, so what we refer to as cyber infrastructure. So when you build a cyber infrastructure like this, um, it takes some things, some secret sauce, so to say, to go from data to discovery and use of that discovery for impact. Um, in a way, the data, the discovery happens when you can amplify the value of data related to an area, X in this case, and then you can use that discovery or insight you're getting from the data, which is what I refer to as value, to benefit something. That's the impact, the why it could be in business domain, science, society, education, you name it. And this is in a way the data science revolution we are talking about, age-old fields are uh, being uh, transformed with effects of data and computing uh, are able to basically take advantage of big data and uh, use computing on demand often uh, to analyze this data. But again, it's nothing with an, without an impact. And for that impact, we need to focus on what problem we are solving. Then we can go to data and computing and all those bits that I'm going to talk about. So that's how we started. Um, what if our problem was wildfires? Uh, and this is a very uh, unfortunately related subject these days because we had devastating wildfires. Three of the most destructive 20 fires in history happened over the last two months. And uh, this was just September 9th uh, of a NASA Gibbs satellite image from our uh, infrastructure that I just screenshot that day. It shows a lot of fires burning and the effects of smoke on it. But my personal story with fires in California started in October 2003. Um, there were multiple fires burning in San Diego, uh, including the Cedar Fire, Paradise Fire, Ote Fire, as seen in these images. And it was a huge devastation. It was the biggest fire up to that point. It was very destructive. Uh, lives were lost. A lot of property was lost. And it was a lot of economic impact to the region as well. But it was about the time also data revolution was starting. There were a lot of uh, networks being built. Um, internet was growing and computing was changing in ways that we could take advantage of it in an on-demand fashion uh, prior to cloud computing. These are 17 years happened since Cedar, Cedar Fire. And unfortunately, 16 of the most destructive 20 fires also happened in those 17 years. And when you look at this list, last year when I had the slide, it was 13. Right? And this year, just last month, three most destructive fires were added to it, shown in uh, red here. When you look at those 17 years, also the image on the left shows all the historical fires in those black dots on the image, so to say. And we see uh, there were a lot of burning going on in the west of the United States with some sprinkled into the east as well. And some of these California fires um, were even more destructive than that 2003 fire. Right. And to me, the most devastating is the campfire with 85 lives. But the devastation comes in all kinds of forms, in property, in the number of acres burned, or um, economical impact. So there was a lot going on over these 17 years. And we've seen an increase in use of data and technology to manage and combat these fires uh, by uh, response agencies, by mitigation agencies, and also uh, aftermath of each fire. So let's focus on what's going on now in August and September 2020, and those fires are still burning. This image here shows active fires in Western USA. And when you look at the uh, California region, uh, we see that um, today, this morning, I looked at the hotspots. These fires are still burning, right? These are hotspots at the fire front, and they extend the perimeter of the fire. 
So there are the officially announced perimeters and there's the growth of the fire. And when we talk about containment versus, you know, uh, percentages of that and things like that, it's about that fire front. So there's the burned area and there's the burning area and there's a the growth. And if we can capture that growth and use that behavior of the fire together with other things, we can predict a little easier where the fire will be in the next couple of hours and maybe manage, and manage that differently. Um, another example is the Bobcat fire in LA, closer to our area. Um, and we see that it's very active still. There is a lot of burn going on. Uh, this is again a Modis and Beers hotspot detection overlaid on the active perimeter uh, for the Bobcat fire from this morning. But it's not just environmental. These fires generate a lot of smoke and we breed that and it becomes a public health problem at times. Or fires in California affect other areas. Just this morning again, I was reading um, the smoke nearly uh, reaching Europe or my friend in Barcelona actually told me that it was on the news that it reached uh, her area. So there is a lot going on and it affects us globally. Even regionally, we are affected in a different way, more devastatingly. Uh, this is a global problem and there are many reasons for that. And how can technology help, right? Um, we need to understand why these fires are happening. As I said, there are many reasons for that. And I left some press links also here and there that I find useful to understand what's going on for our audience. Um, but fires are part of our uh, natural ecology. So a lot of the fire adopted ecosystems, so to say, exist in our region. Uh, and there's a lot of fuel loads due to suppression, due to, uh, and there's climate change effects. Uh, there's a lot of building at the, what we call the wildland urban interface. So we are actually living in there, fires naturally happen. And that creates some fuel load uh, and with drought and higher temperatures there. So, if we can get a handle on those, uh, it would be easier to manage also some of these fires and model these fires. And the fire, as I mentioned, depends on a number of things, but when it burns, how it's going to behave is very weather dependent. Um, and on a regular day, for instance, this is a ignition point in um, LA area. That ignition point would burn, and if you look at the acres and population, it's still manageable and it's probably suppressible uh, with some uh, firefighting. But on what we call the fire weather, our Santa Ana Bay is defined by a relative humidity less than 15% or fuel moisture even less than that. Um, and the fire transitions from the surface fire to uh, what they call uh, crown fires, and um, it has different types of behavior, like um, it creates these uh, effects of um, fire whirls, or you know, it creates these different uh, cloud-like fire structures. So, and spotting increases. So that means this fire can actually uh, change behavior with the effects of the wind a lot. Uh, more and it also grows a lot faster. Then you look at the same fire over the same time frame in this case, then you look to the one with the Santa Ana weather, then we see the acreage is almost um, tenfold here, right? And when you look at the population and housing in the way of the fire, it grows even more. Um, so Depending on the weather, these fires can be very destructive and hard to control, but uh, they can be managed if, uh, you know, the population and the houses can be protected uh, with some firefighting if we knew where they will be and maybe some other firefighting techniques can be applied to it and similarly for evacuations. And the good news is this, mod uh, this fire behavior can be modeled both before, during and after fire. During a fire, uh, there are simplified models that you could use uh, that could be used in operations. And there are also longer running, more um, fire physics involved or computationally heavy, so to say, 
coupled models that show atmospheric interactions with the fire and things like that. They could also be used to capture the behavior of a fire or understand the behavior of a fire in the long term. And these all depend on knowledge of the weather fuel, which is the biomass that burns during a fire, and also the landscape, the topography and uh, things like that. So we looked into initially uh, these different models and we tinkered with what can we do during a fire in the operational context and how can we use data to advance what can be done. And uh, there are lots of ways again to model the fire and using data and computing. And there's a recent article from September 4th that I uh, put here that explains some of that and how this fire modeling programs evolved. So um, what I'll focus on today is what we call data-driven fire modeling then. More about the operational uh, fire models and uh, which the same data sets and techniques I'm going to talk about can be used for other types of models as well. Uh, but most of my talk, uh, given the operational context of it, uh, will focus on uh, the operational model. And this type of models depend on data coming from many different sources. So uh, these data sets can be come from better forecasts models. Uh, this is actually from uh, a tool called Firebuster. And uh, there are different tools that different forecasting agencies use. Uh, and we can incorporate those different forecasts for the weather. Um, there's also um, ground-based weather stations, right? Um, you can get weather and camera imagery, the mountaintop cameras that we can access to, to look at the fires. Um, there are databases to uh, capture uh, land cover and feel that the biomass uh, information, what burns in the fire information. And these, of course, change over the course of time. And uh, some of these databases, uh, there's an opportunity to update them, which aren't happening uh, in a non-data driven context. And the topography, as I mentioned, and the landscape and what's the built infrastructure and things like that uh, can be an input to these models. And the growth of the fire, where is the fire from? If we can have a handle on that through satellites, through uh, remote sensing, through flight runs over it, uh, we can probably learn about how the fire is growing and incorporate that into fire modeling. So when there are such a variety of sources and data sets, they come with challenges. For instance, their resolutions, they can be in different time and spatial resolutions. So there needs to be a way to integrate them, or they could be even in different units that require some processing or different scientific formats. Um, so there's a need to catalog them, first of all, being able to find, access, reuse these data sets is a challenge. But beyond that, integrating them in a way that we can create insight out of this data in a location specific way. That's what we refer to here as intelligent infrastructure. Uh, can we understand how we are going to use these different data sets in the context of that local environment and context of that incident happening in that locale? But once we build such an infrastructure um, that has the potential for that impact. Remember that impact that we'd like to make and that could advance fire science in different ways and that could also help with operational uh, wildfire intelligence. So this was our motivation when we started. Why Fire, the project I'm going to talk about today, has been built with these in mind. And it has an infrastructure in the back end, which is again what we call a cyber infrastructure in the National Science Foundation context. And that was built for data driven modeling, monitoring, and resilience infrastructure. So, using data in a scalable way in computing uh, to understand about wildfires and being able to model them. And this was prior to having access to a lot of these data sets I'm talking about. So it was really built as a research project initially uh, to create that innovation to build one platform that communicates data 
to what we call workflows to automate use of computing and physics-based fire models together with data. So we can combine them and then overlay this information through maps or other environments through portals to uh, parties that can make use of this. Um, so it was about continuous monitoring of any data that's openly available for this type of uh, work and turning that data into bits of visualizations that communicate that better. It could be on a map, it could be on a 3D environment where you go in and you are in a uh, augmented reality environment that you could look at the fires and different data sets and different visual modes. And also, uh, as I'm gonna talk about today, you could use that to adjust models. You can learn about the dynamics of an ongoing fire, how it's behaving and combine that understanding uh, with the knowledge of the physics within a model and adjust the parameters to run that model so it's going to give better and better, more and more accurate results about the ongoing incident. So this was the goal and the innovation towards this goal was our ability to combine these data science bits, data management, data science, computing bits with fire science. So this is why I call it using big data, this heterogeneous variety of data sets uh, with fire modeling, physics-based fire models at scale. So at the scale in a computing environment or geospatially or temporally that we need to run these models so we can generate that impact. And there are some components to it in these bullets and on our website and publications that uh, I encourage you to look at. But this is the first generation, so to say, why fire side infrastructure that was built. And it surprised us because when we started building these data management and integration services, we noticed that community is using that. And we also combined it with map-based environments so we can communicate uh, the products and fire modeling using these to different audiences. And behind them, of course, there's these automated integrated workflows and curation and other types of machine learning pipelines, AI pipelines that prepare the data and hone the impacts that are uh, received from these uh, both data and models. And again, communicate those to fire science and response audiences. But what we are most surprised about or proud of at the same time is our growing community of more than 130 organizations, many individuals and uh, the public who actually comes to iFire and FireMap for situational awareness during these events. So based on the success of this first grant, we created a lab that then we made it our mission to turn uh, data and artificial intelligence and computing uh, into a utility to advance fire science, but also its application to practice working with the science community. Uh, and we have uh, both government and industry partners as well as research and academic partners in this space and they're uh, growing as well. But let's go back a step. I said dynamic data driven fire modeling. I said it depends on data. How does it look like and what were the enablers? When we started around 2010, there were two main enablers here. One is our high performance wireless research and education network, HPRAN, which was at the time the only back, -end, uh, back county uh, network that had these mountaintop cameras and weather stations and it was growing by uh, uh, the involvement of stg and &E, our energy company and others. Um, and Farsight was the operational behavior modeling system used by Forest Service, built and used by Forest Service. So these we use as enablers to uh, make the case, so to say. But even an earlier example than that is, can we now use better station data to understand Santa Ana conditions better by combining it with physics-based weather models? So again, Santa Ana conditions are defined by wind direction, speed, humidity, and temperature. And normally at that time, uh, when we started, each sensor, each weather station would communicate data to the HPRN infrastructure and HPRN would generate alerts on what sensor, what weather station is reading Santa Ana conditions. So when you do that and generate those alerts, you see something like that. It's very pinpoint oriented but this is a region with different topography and it's really, um, you need to do something else if you wanna generate more targeted and regional or specific low higher resolution alerts. Um, so we 
use a VIN modeling tool called VIN Ninja. And for each tile, so to say, we would get this data and model using Win Ninja the effects of the wind. Uh, and to be able to do that, you know, temporal coverage basically you can do it on a regular interval, and spatial coverage is the tiling of San Diego region. Uh, you need to use parallel approaches, data parallel approaches in this case. Each of these tiles can be computed individually and then stitched together uh, for insight. Then you do that, that pinpoint based, uh, by the way, when you do that, it needs to be communicated. So it needs to be turned into uh, GIS based uh, geographical information systems. So it could be placed on any map that you'd like to place that. So it needs to get, go through some more processing that can be automated with these workflows. So each step shows you, you know, changing the format into something that you can finally put on a map, which then would look like this. Instead of those pinpoints, you would then generate alerts uh, for these uh, various regions. And I'm having, a, okay, there we go. So you would see, um, you know, alerts being generated over regions rather than each pin here would be reading a Santa Ana condition, but the effects of Santa Ana's are on those uh, red zones. So it's a higher resolution weather in terms of spatial and temporal uh, context. So this is sort of a curation of that and combining a physics understanding of the weather models and the uh, real time data. So during a fire, how can we use data-driven fire modeling, right? Uh, one thing that everybody wants to know is where is the fire and where will it go after that? So it's the direction and rate of spread. So you could do a similar thing of bringing now uh, real-time data about landscape, um, you know, all those things that I listed before with fire parameters into a physics-based fire simulator, which is the far side. In this case, it's a, again, operational model. It's a simplified model uh, compared to some others. And once you run that, you can communicate that on a map. That was the original idea. But then we talk about fire parameters. If we receive these fire parameters over time, there is this modeled fire, which is the operational wildfire model fire side in this case, and the fire front it thinks the fire will be. And then those actual wildfire measurements, if you can get them on a regular basis, you can adjust actually what the model did, what, what was learned from the real time and assimilate that information and reparameterize, which leads to you know, these growing and self-updating modeling capability, which is what happened here. And it's a form of AI. But where else can we use AI in this context is when you look at it to have that working uh, even the data to assimilation part, right? You need that perimeter and you don't need just any old perimeter. You need a perimeter with some quality information or uncertainty of, you know, how accurate this perimeter that was collected, measured is. Um, you also need other information as we talked about. The better we can make those information, the better the models will be. Or, the, you know, you can parameterize models according to some of this. So um, either the ignition point at that perimeter comes from some AI interface and fuel databases. There are multiples of them. There are some what we call boutique databases. That's about an area that's higher resolution and it could be pretty valuable to learn about the most recent fuels. Similarly, there are multiple weather prediction models and observed weather uh, sources like weather stations. And, can we combine them to generate the combined better that fits that locale and our understanding of that locale based on previous experience in modeling. So all of these are, you know, where I put AI is sort of this artificial intelligence or machine learning opportunities or data science opportunities that feed into this. Okay, so this was the type of workflows we came up with and it was a research, ongoing research. Um, but we didn't have really an operational context in mind. You know, we thought this would be at some point hopefully useful. We were advised by some operational uh, uh, individuals uh, with roles in operations or the government agencies, as well as scientists. But it didn't happen until we really started a collaboration with the LA Fire Department in 2015. And there, first of all, we didn't have ongoing fire perimeter information from anything that flies over the fire. So that was an information we could receive from LA when we started our collaboration. 
but also it pushed us to think how the practic practice needs to see the information these models are generating. So we came up with an environment in collaboration with the LA Fire Department that is um, highly useful in the context of the current incident and enables seeing these type of active perimeter satellite detections weather and real-time data and gives the user who is knowledgeable of course in modeling ability to put these together in real time to generate these operational models based on Farsight. So this is the fire map interface and there's a public part to it which shows open data sets that public can normally have access to but not all together in one platform and also it communicates those to fire models um, in the back end uh, for expert users that have accounts and things like that. But when you look at the different part, different things on that platform, uh, you would see things like surface fields, camera feeds from HPRN and alert wildfire cameras. You would see satellite detections, weather stations. Uh, you would see, uh, if you're an expert user, you're able to model. You would see uh, a you know, representative model as you've seen here. And also uh, what kind of population and acreage that was reached. There are some other things about satellite data as you've seen some pictures of existing fires on satellites or different weather uh, models. So the environment become really successful in terms of or useful I should say uh, for Southern California fire agencies. Our community grew from there and it was used in a number of different fires over time. So I have some screenshots. So for instance, these cameras, when you click on them, you can look at each camera and um, you know, what it's showing. Some of these, as you see, show an existing fire. There's smoke coverage in there. And if you clicked on any of those images, uh, you would go to either HPRN or alert wildfire interfaces. Uh, for instance, this one, there's an active perimeter, as you see to the right. And there is, there are two, views over that camera, one to the east, one to the west. And when you look at the west camera, there's no fire. You can actually look at it, bring that pin over, and uh, you would see it in fire map. But if there was a fire there, like in this case, it's obvious because it's the nighttime view type of thing, and to the east, uh, it would translate, it could put a bunch of pins and you could create sort of a perimeter over that that's uh, geolocated. So we do other types of AI and interesting bits like smoke detection, location detection, and things like that with these camera images. But this is a simplified example of manually generating these. Right? Um, and that perimeter information, as I mentioned, is absolutely useful in understanding what the fire is doing and how it compares to what's in the fire models as behavior um, that the models capture and it could uh, help. So then uh, this grew into a partnership with San Diego Fire Department and General Atomics in 2017. Uh, and we were able to receive IR infrared based views over the fire and perimeters that are actually captured by planes. And based on that, the modeling and this loop was tested on and on through different uh, fires. But this was the first example of them models being generated and set, being sent to the scout system used by the state at that time through the San Diego Fire Department's efforts. And this was a lilac fire. And, um, you know, the fire actually uh, slowed down after a while uh, through the, to the, uh, into the night by uh, the changing wind and conditions. So it actually stopped and become less destructive uh, than many others. And Thomas Fire was another fire that this was exercised. But if uh, some of you might remember Thomas Fire, it burned for a long time and it had multiple weather incidents, like four weather incidents, uh, I think three or four evacuation orders to the different communities. And uh, when you look at December 10, this is the fire front, right? I'm not sure if my um, cursor is visible. Uh, and by December 17, it moved towards Santa Barbara. And this is sort of that uh, extension. And then you were able to actually overlay these. You'll see four, one, two, three, 
and four weather events happening uh, that made this fire uh, flare up in different directions and uh, in, into different communities. So these are videos generated quickly from satellite feeds and coverage across them. Come fall 2019, um, we were able to uh, be a part of a pilot program or Southern California uh, funded uh, through uh, the assembly called FIRES. Um, so assembly women, Pretty Norris, were uh, the leader who made this happen through uh, Orange County. So it was led by Orange County Fire Authority in partnership with many uh, San Diego, uh, Southern California Fire Department and uh, two industry partners, Interra and uh, Courtney Aviation and also uh, the university partner, which is uh, my fire team. And this is a public-private partnership that was used in over 60 fires, or 50 fires, sorry, uh, last year. Actually, by the end, it was over 60. But the first two months were really the height of it, uh, that when I was able to make this uh, representative slide. Um, so what fire, by fire did is, there would be an aircraft waiting. The aircraft was prepaid actually to generate those captures of the fire front using the infrared fixed wing aircraft. And uh, then it would be communicated to our industry partner in Terra, uh, which is a type of a common operating picture. And from there, the parameters would be shared into Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi would do modeling through an organization we built. Uh, we called it the Southern California Fusion center led by LA Fire Department. And uh, then that would be communicated back into the common operating picture of Intera. So this actually shows when you build these public-private partnerships, how strong this could be and how science can be a part of this overall operational effort uh, led by um, operational agencies, so to say. But there is more to it, right? Because it's not just a plane. Um, it's also all the rest of the information that was combined in FireMap. Uh, the fusion center will look for ignition points, like the blue marker here. But then uh, the staff in the fusion center that is commonly staffed with um, LA Fire Department, fire behavior analysts, and also some of the modelers from our group, uh, data scientists from our group. Um, then through the cameras and triangulation of what's seen in the cameras about this fire and other resources, that um, marker would turn into, you know, a little bit more accurate location, which is the red marker. And the first model will be generated in a matter of minutes. It's like two minutes. And uh, so this was a really highly uh, rapid operation. And when the planes go up, then the modeling would start. This is the end model, so to say. Uh, or sorry, and perimeter the plane captured. But for that to happen until that happened, you know, many perimeters over time because plane is going over the fire, collecting these perimeters. And there's this Bordeaux-ish fire model in the back end, and it shows how actually close the model was to that end perimeter. Um, that would be generated at each time step based on the knowledge of what was captured and modeled before. So this was the general mode of operations in fires, fires last year, and we just started Fire Risk 2020, so it's in progress. And I showed some things about Bobcat Fire, for instance, approaching Mount Wilson, uh, it was a capture from Monday, and also the weather wind uh, that comes from HRR, our, um, along with the satellite detections of the hotspots and the active fire perimeters of the El Dorado fire. So these are combined with fire models and all the information we can get from the planes. So that's the operational context. And there is a public use aspect of, as I mentioned, there is some open data sets that we make available, never the perimeters, because those are for uh, experience uh, fire response communities and uh, the modeling features are for fire behavior analysts. But there are things public can make use of like the red flag alerts, fire perimeters, uh, satellite detections, um, smoke plumes. Uh, you know, these are situational awareness or, you know, information that you can find elsewhere that could help us also 
protect ourselves or you know maybe sort of make it gives us a little bit more ease of mind over a situation and we did not understand i should say until 2017 how impactful this could be we had in that first time we had millions of hits like a website that doesn't normally have um more than 100 hits a day suddenly during a fire incident gets all these millions of hits and 800,000 unique visitors. It's like a town full of people uh, almost. Um, so, and our ability to scale really helped in that situation. It required on-demand scalability of access to this infrastructure and we were able to hold both operational and this public context uh, quite well, thanks to that infrastructure. And that comes back to our research in cyber infrastructure, that dynamic behavior of the infrastructure uh, and ability of the environment to do things a lot more flexibly. And there are some new research directions we are taking. Of course, we are not uh, only operational or public facing. We are still, uh, we have a big responsibility to do, to do science and also be useful to the fire science community. And uh, so, and we are making those slowly a part of the operational context when they are ready, when we feel they'll be useful. Um, I'll talk about two parts to it. Uh, I want to talk about new fire models we are in incorporating and ensemble fire models. I want to talk about policy driven data exchange that we are implementing for some partners. And uh, also, um, I won't talk again about the science to practice operations we do for state and local programs. But I'll talk about two things. One is the how do we use computing and the other is how do we generate data that gets useful using AI and machine learning. So this continuous iteration we talked about integration, learning and data assimilation requires some special computing. And remember that integration of AI slide that I showed, these are the AI bits. And now I'm adding that to computing environments that these AI bits need to or could take advantage of. That could be you know, cloud and HPC, for instance, for fire modeling. But smoke detection, we want to do it at the cameras, where the site is. It's called edge computing, at the edge of the data, rather than bringing the data and losing that time. Um, on demandness of fire modeling and some of this require cloud uh, compatible infrastructure rather than the batch mode of being in a high performance computing queue and waiting for it and you know it needs to be responsive it needs to be quick and it needs to be elastic when we need more resources we need to have access to those so we build an ecosystem uh, Sage, for instance, is uh, one of those infrastructures, is the cyber infrastructure at the edge. A lot of these are funded by NSF because they are research projects, National Science Foundation. Um, and in Sage, what we are doing is we are adding uh, edge processors for AI to the edge of networks um, of, you know, funded by National Science Foundation and others like NEON, HPRAN is one of those networks. AOT area of things, that's a city scale one, and others. Like uh, there's the zoos and other uh, uh, platforms as well that these are added. So we do, for instance, smoke detection or weather analysis or soil moisture alerts type of AI bits at the edge, so it's closer to the data. And the insights we get from them, there's a smoke, it's at this location. And some of these are researchy bits uh, that require a lot more work to be operationalized. Some of those are almost ready. Um, then that gets used uh, in the uh, cloud for doing fire modeling. And in the middle, uh, we, when we need this AI infrastructure, uh, there could be a lot more of use of the networks. For instance, there's a Pacific research platform that gives us 100 gigabit this to this connectivity, 10 to 100 gigabit across UC campuses. And when you have a network like that, and if you manage it in a dynamically allocatable way, it actually becomes useful to add then computing devices, in this case, GPUs across that network and take advantage of it in a, what I call composable fashion. So you can compose any of these resources for doing AI at high speed uh, and together with the data you're getting. And these are sort of this IO devices that are high speed 
and they're managed by uh, Kubernetes and the ecosystem that comes with it. But they are cloud compatible and can be integrated any, into any public and private cloud for further scalability. And one of the things we are adding in our latest supercomputer, which is Expanse, uh, is that heter uh, composable system capability. So we are slowly bringing that supercomputing capability of uh, high precision and uh, uh, other types of uh, HPC-like features uh, into the fold. So when there's a fire model that needs to take advantage of that, we could also maybe schedule some of, the, some of these fire models on those platforms uh, and still use the rest of it. So it, it is aligned with that concept of the AI requires some capability, but the modeling and simulation requires other types of capabilities and capa mainly capacity for HPC high performance computing. And this is a part of that AI and cloud image I showed, like collect imagery and get the perimeter and parameterize the fire model and execute it and integrate that model into product. Um, but then you actually look at uh, what's under the hood here, that thing that looks really simple can have a lot of uh, little boxes and things that are being taken care of with these infrastructure and their interfaces. But when you look at it, what goes from that smoke entrance at the edge to the cloud, so to say, that middle infrastructure is a smoke detection message of there's a smoke, here's the photo, here's the timestamp, and here's the camera ID. That we reduce that camera information into one bit that can be transferred instantly. Um, so that's the computing part. And how do we handle the data? We, collect, we are collecting or federating a lot of these open and sometimes not open data sets, not that publicly accessible data sets and we are modeling on them. So this pushed us in a direction that we'd like these data and models to be findable and useful to both fire signs and other use inspired communities. And we call this Wi-Fi Commons. One example to that is um, the utilities generating data, like sdg &E. We have a partnership with San Diego Gas and Electric. And we make the data they generate accessible in in a findable, reusable, responsible mode um, so that um, those data sets can be useful, not just to the utility, but in open context to science and others that might take advantage of these. So these are um, better ensembles for models. You know, they have the fire potential index. There are some special fuel information they might be generating. So it goes back into the public space, so to say, uh, and becomes available to science and other use through this commons infrastructure. And we are using these for modeling. So we decided data commons isn't enough. Uh, there needs to be some form of model commons that there's a way to generate new models on top of these data sets and also catalog them so they could be useful for inference in SAGE, for instance, or other contexts. So Wi-Fi Commons is a new NSF project. We just started on this path. Uh, but we have a lot of actually operational or not operational, but uh, sort of products that um, came out of this that uh, we are happy to share soon. And we are running like community workshops to bring the community together, which is the big part of this, right? Any impactful infrastructure, we need that community integration. And there's a list of machine learning models that could be generated on something like this from Santana condition detections or long and short term prediction of some phenomena to fuel models, um, or even listening to some, you know, communication on the uh, radios to come up with a better understanding of local conditions, which is sometimes the only information that's available. But all of these require that data commons, that uh, periodic, dynamic, programmatic access to data. Any data that gets generated should be accessible uh, in uh, real time or near real time when we have connection. So one example to that is using satellite imagery, high resolution satellite imagery uh, to generate fuel updates over time. So this is research, but what we are able to do is we can tile up a uh, half a meter resolution scene from a satellite, for instance, and create a machine learning model to group together in these columns in the middle, the similar ones those ones that share some properties that the model can find and group. 
And all of these then becomes something that we could see on the map. For instance, this cluster one, I guess this is cluster six here actually, um, has those yellow tiles. That's where they are in the scene. And when you look at the scene, there are houses, there's wildland, that's the interface data. And when you actually look at all those different columns, you could see, uh, you know, some houses light up in some of them. They could be houses with pools or they, may, they might be houses with some uh, uh, trees coming over the roof or risk management, or it could be grass or chaparral, that's the general uh, areas. So these are detectable through access to data, and this is a proof of concept of them. But when you look at what that generates compared to what's already available, it's a lot more higher resolution. And that information can be not just useful in fire prevention, uh, but also land use, urban development, conservation, and things like that. So having this model cataloged and useful for different types of uh, context, uh, that model commons uh, we are hoping will be useful for different types of science as well. In fact, we built similar models for things like mapping of slums in India or uh, distribution of or evolution of uh, refugee camps and, you know, maybe detecting schools in Africa with some different partners. So th the techniques are available and you know, they need to, of course, improve over time with community involvement and more AI and science, but uh, they are useful in the context of different use cases. So this was an overview of Wi-Fi, but we had a lot of lessons learned. And the biggest lesson learned is these teams are, you know, there's a lot of data, of course, big data. There's a multidisciplinary team that needs to come together that has expertise in data management, data science, domain science, and this fire science in this case, or better science, and advanced infrastructure. And through integration of that, that's the machinery, in our cases, workflows and maps and databases and things like that, um, it turns into what we call translational innovation. That is the impact, right? being able to translate that science into a, or technology into a practice and making it useful. And that requires community participation from the beginning, not at the end. So there needs to be collaborations, public-private partnerships to build things together. And when you look at Wi-Fi, I need to mention this because there's a lot of prior work and infrastructure. We are taking advantage of this. And these are prior uh, government investments through NSF and DOE and others, or US Forest Service like in Farsight. Uh, but it's also um, people, a lot of people that could actually solve and make impact beyond this fire science. Um, so when you look at by fire itself, I think the impact isn't just in fire modeling, but it's also showing how you can integrate community and technology and science and data in a solution architecture. And that's not just technical solution architecture for community as well. And uh, there's a lot of things we discovered about different techniques and workflows, data services, machine learning, that's the uh, computer science and data science impact. And it's very expensive, um, extendable or extensible. Uh, you can expand that to, you know, geospatial, uh, different types of geospatial data streams. So you can add those in. Uh, it could be moved with some work and adding different data uh, sources and uh, the fire modeling capabilities into different geographical areas. Um, you know, the same data can be useful for different types of hazards. I think we should think of uh, disasters and hazards as a system of systems, right? Mudslides, floods, earthquakes. These require understanding of uh, environmental conditions as well. And the same infrastructure by changing what kind of model or interaction between these disasters could be useful to multiple hazards. And we even use the same infrastructure for COVID-19. We had a project that requires IoT wearables and surveys and uh, spread data, and we were able to combine them and you know, uh, enable others to do models of these combined data sets for uh, understanding of the disease. Of course, it's teamwork, you know, uh, this requires a team and when you start sharing, it becomes a growing team. And I'm really proud of uh, the team and what we build and everyone's willingness to work with each other, understand different domains. And 
we are looking forward to working with both fire science and response communities further uh, while of course um, staying as researchers and creating research impact as well in the um, cyber infrastructure domain and data science computational science I left some links here. There are some news articles. There's actually some tutorials on how to use the infrastructure at our YouTube channel because we get a lot of public queries on how to use it, how to find things. So we started that recently. Uh, and there's publications for the science groups and uh, for the technologists, there's the APIs and uh, for response agencies, there's the fire map link here. And uh, please feel free to contact us anytime and I'm uh, able to take some questions uh, over the next 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs>